Is Trump's deportation plan unreasonably expensive? It depends on who you ask. But let me just drill down with you, because by some estimates, that mass deportation plan could cost as much as $88 billion a year just to deport one million people, Senator. Would you approve of a package that big, which would undoubtedly add to the national debt? I agree with the president when I, where we need to start. We need to start with the people who are felons who have left in this, been left in this country, people who are on the terrorist watch list, people who have been convicted in other countries of murder and rape, people who are causing crimes in this country. That's the place to start, and that's where President Trump is about to start. With the incoming Trump administration, there is plenty of talk around the plans for the country moving forward, which is nice because we didn't get a whole lot of that during the election. At least we didn't hear as much talk about the realities of how certain things would get accomplished and how much they would cost the taxpayers to implement and execute. That was Republican Senator John Barrasso from Wyoming, a man who represents just really a handful of Americans, relatively speaking, discussing Trump's costly plan to deport millions of people living in the United States. Now, Trump says the price tag is of no consequence to him, probably because the taxpayers will be paying it, not him. And he doesn't seem concerned about what his plan will mean for the already exorbitant national debt. But we already know that Republicans do not care about the national debt. Why would they, especially under Trump, start to care about it now? A new report says the cost of any mass deportation effort, if enacted, could be catastrophic. That's the word the report uses to our country. According to the American Immigration Council, removing all of the 13.3 million immigrants without legal status in the United States in a one-time operation, if achievable, would cost the federal government at least $315 billion. Mass deportations of this kind could also lead to a loss of as much as 6.8 percent of the United States' annual gross domestic product, or more than one trillion dollars. So there's the secret. That's why Tom Holman pissed off. Because we had this locked down. And I tell you what, Washington Post can do all the stories they wanted me about. Tom Holman deport people is really good at it. They ain't seen it yet. Wait till 2025. The argument in support of the $88 billion, however, is that illegal immigration is already costing the country billions of dollars, billions of dollars more than just 88. According to a Newsweek article from earlier this year, an ongoing border crisis that saw 5,000 illegal aliens being released into the United States per day in December of last year is a microcosm of a much larger issue. The issue is a $150.7 billion one shared between federal and state governments, and that's just one year. Since the inauguration of President Biden on January 20th, 2021, over 3.3 million illegal immigrants have been released into the United States, according to the Committee on the Judiciary and Subcommittee on Immigration Integrity, Security and Enforcement, which is costing taxpayers billions at the federal and state levels. That $150.7 billion figure comes from the Federation for American Immigration Reform, or FAIR, which analyzed the various costs of illegal immigration, such as emergency medical care, incarceration, and welfare expenditures. The figure they arrived at was actually higher than that, but they subtracted $32 billion from the total, taking into account the taxes paid to the government by illegal immigrants, because yes, they do pay taxes. Barrasso continued to perpetuate the myth that the majority of these illegal immigrants are criminals and rapists and whatever, but it is possible to disagree with illegal immigration without having to demonize the immigrants on a personal level, especially when it's just not true. The overwhelming vast majority of them are just trying to live in a world where they are not constantly looking over their shoulders. They come here, they want to work, they want to live, and they want their children to be safe just like the rest of us. And I think that that's part of the conversation that's been missing from the left. I remember talking about this on a show here on TYT maybe over a year ago. We can't pretend that illegal immigration is not a problem because it is. The numbers are there. But that doesn't mean we need to dehumanize the people who are trying to get here or treat them like animals or call them criminals. Border walls and mass deportations are just band-aid solutions to a much more complex problem. So if either party wants to realistically curb illegal immigration, they would be working to find actual long-lasting solutions. 
Those types of solutions are often much more difficult to negotiate and implement, so band-aids can often be very appealing in the face of a seemingly overwhelming issue. But in the long term, rooting out those issues from the ground up is often less costly and much more sustainable. Solutions that require constant, active, and forceful vigilance is only going to require more of an ongoing effort with less change over time. Even if efforts deter illegal immigration in the short term, the minute you lessen those efforts, the issue will crop up again. All right, I know I have been mostly MIA since the election. That was planned months in advance because I, you know, I had some things going on in my personal life at around the same time, but it was nice. I was able to process everything from a distance without being completely inundated with hot takes of how and why this happened and analyses of who is really to blame for the election results and threats of what's coming now that Trump has been reelected. And I know I do this work for a living and the views on these videos matter, but really sometimes it is a good idea to just turn off your screens and step back from everything, even just for a moment. That's a big part of why I'm not very active on social media. First thoughts and initial reactions are not always valuable or ideal when discussing these very large topics, topics that embody a million different moving parts and a ton of emotion. Some things require and deserve some thought and deliberation behind them. Besides, you're no good to anyone if you're spiraling, and we've got a lot of work to do going forward. But the election really put some things that I had already been feeling into sharp perspective for me. I did think Kamala Harris had a good shot at winning. I thought maybe we could get rid of Ted Cruz here in Texas, but I knew that was a long shot. Anyway, all of that turned out to be wrong, but that's the way it goes sometimes, right? You can't take it personally. That's why I don't like making political predictions, generally speaking, even though I am asked to do so every once in a while. These things for all of our polling and all of our surveys and street interviews and ideas of what should or should not happen are actually quite fickle. They can turn on a dime at any point, even on election day itself. And they're fickle because people are fickle. And I don't even mean that in a disparaging way. We are driven by our emotions, specifically by our fears. And as much as none of us would like to admit it, we are easily manipulated. And I know the left likes to pretend that the right is full of fear mongering, but we have to acknowledge that there is plenty of fear on the left and coming out of the left. We are afraid of the coming years. We are afraid of things that will not only directly impact our personal lives and the lives of the people we love, but we're afraid of what will happen to our values and institutions, to our very democracy. We're afraid of what will happen on the international stage. We're afraid of what will happen to the climate and to the planet. Whether or not those fears are founded and legitimate is your own opinion, but we all have to find a way to move forward despite feeling those fears because we don't have a choice otherwise. It's simply not an option to throw your hands up in the air and say, I give up. I am already exasperated at the thought of reliving those 2016 to 2020 years all over again, this time with everything being worse than it was back then. This time he won the popular vote. We can't take solace in a technical electoral victory anymore. This time he is emboldened. His coalition of supporters are emboldened. He has gotten away with an incredible amount of wrongdoing with little more than a slap on the wrist. And now he's our president again, this time with more support than he had before he did all the stuff that he has done. On top of that, this country has lost its grip on reality because in this modern era, there are two different realities. There's the reality of what is on our computer and phone screens, and then there's the reality of the world outside of our front doors, and they are not the same. What's to blame for this? I wouldn't say it's any one individual thing that we can point a finger at, but there is a lack of community these days that arguably wasn't as big of a problem just 20 years ago. I was just telling my husband this morning that I feel physically stuck and isolated in our neighborhood because it takes effort just for me to get out into the world thanks in large part to the car-centric infrastructure of our urban developments. Instead of real community, we have been given a digital community instead, and those have made us vulnerable to to misinformation and disinformation, and it's warped our sense of what the world is and what our role within that world 
actually is or it could be. Then there's the reality of people who want to take care of the issues we face at home before worrying about what's going on overseas. Democrats and progressives tend to think that we still need to address our overseas issues, specifically Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Palestine, while Republicans generally want more focus on home. But neither side is necessarily wrong for feeling the way they do. You can argue that it's an issue where some people are more informed than others on certain issues, but whatever, you can have that argument all day. It won't change anything because it really comes down to a matter of prioritization. We as progressives cannot pretend that it isn't difficult to live in this country today for reasons that are probably avoidable. The housing market is out of control. Wages are dismal. Layoffs are rampant. Just an example, people love to complain about grocery store prices, but two major grocery chains are about to merge, something that our government is allowing to happen, but it's only going to make the pricing issue worse for the average consumer. Both political parties prop up corporate America above all else. That's nothing new. That is something that Americans across the aisle have big problems with, whether or not they're informed enough to identify it or speak on it explicitly. And speaking of international crises, I've said this a million times before, there is always two sides to these conflicts. And I'm not talking about the two sides that are fighting each other. I'm talking about the ideological side of the issue and then the political side. Countries like the United States do not get involved in international conflicts to the tune of billions of dollars because of some high moral standing. They only get involved if and when there is some kind of financial and or political benefit for them to do so. The ideological side of things is just what's used to sell the unsavory actions of the government to the public. People can stomach the idea of its government funding and otherwise enabling the slaughter of thousands of innocent people if they believe it's for some kind of greater good or higher power. Both parties play this ideological game with the public. So while we're all arguing semantics with one another and debating about the justness of our military or whatever, the government is doing whatever it wants to do in the meantime. Do I think the Trump administration will help to fix the problems that people are wanting him to fix? No, I'm not confident that he will, but if you're being honest with yourself, you cannot blame people for feeling frustrated with these things because you are frustrated with them too. Perhaps they vote out of desperation, but again, you can't blame people for feeling helpless when we have all felt helpless for a very long time. The best I can hope for with this election is that it was a reckoning for the Democrats. We all knew that a significant portion of the Democratic electorate was either abstaining for voting Dem this, this election or voting for Trump because they were sick of the Democrats, insisting on maintaining the status quo while rejecting its progressive faction and leaning more and more to the right and somehow still pretending to be the party of the people. They've been doing this for decades. They didn't let us have Bernie despite all of the support that was behind him however conspiratorial you want to get with that is up to you I'm not making any claims I'm just making a general point they bypassed the primary process entirely in this election which was something a lot of Democratic voters had problems with and would have liked to have seen handled differently and they lean so far into celebrity as if Beyonce was really going to win this election for Kamala Harris. Of course, Beyonce was going to vote for Harris. Anyone could have safely predicted that. But before that Houston rally, I can't remember the last time I'd heard Beyonce speak about anything, let alone politics. Why should her political opinion matter to anyone? And why are the Democrats acting like Beyonce's speech should have inspired more voters to turn out for Harris? There is a reason why Joe Rogan's endorsement of Trump was miles more significant than Beyonce's endorsement of Kamala Harris. Now, I hope I don't have to clarify that I'm not happy about the election results. I am worried about the next few years and what they're going to look like. I'm already dreading the days of waking up every morning wondering what fresh hell flew out of Trump's mouth while I was asleep. He's already talking about dismantling our system of checks and balances. He's already talking about running for a third presidential term. But stressing about that now isn't going to get me anywhere. I'm almost stubbornly refusing to let this man have much of an effect on me, my emotions, and my mental health because he just doesn't doesn't deserve to. And trust me, this election affects me directly. I will have to figure some things out in my personal life in the years to come, as I'm sure many of you will also have to. But we move on and we have hope that by the end of it, not just the Republican Party, but also the Democratic Party will be transformed for the better. The next few years are going to suck. But we will get through it because we don't really have a choice but to get through them. All right, that's it for me. If you got anything out of this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks.